Now turn to section one. Here a student called Joanna, telling her friend about an arts festival, which is being held in the city where they are studying. First, you have some time to look at questions one and two. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one and two. Hi, Joanna. Where have you been? Hi, Dave. I had to go into college to return a DVD I'd borrowed from the library. Oh, right. But while I was there, I got some information about the City Arts Festival that starts next week. Oh yeah, I saw a poster advertising it somewhere. Yeah, and I picked up this leaflet from the library. It gives you the website address. So as I was there, I logged on to get more information. Actually, although they've got the full program of events fixed now, you can't book online, which seems strange. There's a number to phone, though. Hmm. And are there student discounts? I guess so, but I didn't notice. Anyway, there are three things I'd like to see: an Italian film, a rock concert, and an art exhibition. Oh. <laughs> the exhibition's free, and you don't need to book, so I'll definitely go to that. But I'm going to get tickets for the film in case they sell out.、Mm, good idea. You can always buy concert tickets at the door because that's in a really big hall. Right. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to read questions three to ten. Now listen and answer questions three to ten. So, when does the festival actually start? Well, it's usually held the first week of October, but it's earlier this year for some reason. The opening night is September the twentieth, and events go on till the end of the month. Hmm. And have you got that phone number? Yeah, it's here. Uh, look, it's o nine six seven, double nine o, double seven six. Okay, I'll write it down. O nine six seven, double nine o, double seven six. Thanks. I thought the local council made a profit from the festival, but it says here that there's a commercial sponsor. It's a local bank. I didn't know that. Neither did I. What other events have they got on? Um, as well as the art exhibitions and stuff that's open every day, there are special events each day. Like on Monday, there's a musical in the city hall.、Uh. That's only three pound sixty-five for students. Hmm. I think I'll give that a miss. I've got football training on Mondays, but I'm free on Wednesday. There's a jazz band on then, and that's only two pounds fifty for students. Sounds good. Is that in the city hall too? We could go. Well, I'm busy actually, but it's at the sports centre if you're interested. Oh, right. Thursday's the cheapest event, only one pound twenty-five for students, and it's on in the library. Can you guess what it is? <laughs> Probably the college choir. <laughs> Actually, no, they've not been asked. Apparently. Oh. 
No, it's a poetry evening. Hmm. Isn't there any modern dance on anywhere? On Friday. That's at the college. It's quite expensive, though. Fifteen pounds for adults and twelve pounds seventy-five for students. Ah,、oh, yes, that is a lot. If I'm going to spend that much, I'd prefer to go out on Saturday. Yeah, me too. But on Saturday night there isn't live music or a party or anything, just the fireworks in the city park, and that's only one pound fifty. Yeah, that'd be good. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two, on page one hundred and one of your book. You will hear some information about a medical museum in London, called the Hunterian Museum, which is part of the Royal College of Surgeons. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen. Now listen, and answer questions eleven to fifteen. Good evening. I'm here to tell you about the Hunterian Museum in London, which is part of the Royal College of Surgeons. Although a medical museum, it is open to the general public. The museum specialises in the history of the study of anatomy. And especially the work of John Hunter in the 18th century. If you would like a free guided tour of the museum, then come along at one o'clock any Wednesday. Spaces on the tour are limited to 25, though, so it's best to reserve a place by phone. And these tours are for individual members of the public, families, and small groups of friends only. Tours for groups of school students can also be arranged, and these are also free of charge. Teachers are encouraged to make a donation of around three pounds per student if they can afford it, but this isn't obligatory. What teachers must do, however, is phone to agree a time in advance, as only one school party is allowed in at a time. Then there's an online booking form which you can use to confirm the booking, or just send a letter if you prefer. For older students and adult groups, we provide more specialised tours, and these cost a hundred pounds for a short tour of thirty minutes, or if you want a slightly longer one, it's a hundred and thirty pounds for forty-five minutes. There is a student discount, however, so college groups would pay seventy-five pounds for the shorter tour, for example. In terms of facilities available at the museum, teachers and others should bear in mind that space is very limited, as we're in the centre of London, with many cafes and restaurants nearby. Refreshments aren't sold on site. Though there is a small shop selling souvenirs, most of the things on show in the museum are preserved animal specimens in glass cases, so there are no interactive displays aimed at small children. And our tours are only in English, although there is printed material available in other major languages on request. There's also a lecture room. Which groups can book for an extra charge, 
and this is equipped with PowerPoint projector and microscopes. Before you hear the rest of the presentation, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Next, a bit about the history of the museum and the preserved animal and plant specimens you can see there. The museum's named after John Hunter, who was a pioneer in the study of anatomy. He was among the first to understand that the study of other animals could tell us a lot about how the human body works. John Hunter was born in 1728 and came to London to work as an assistant in an anatomy school in 1748. Here John did his training in the study of human anatomy. It was after 1760, however, that he turned his attention to animals. That's when he became a surgeon in the army, spending three years in France and Portugal, where he started collecting and preserving animal specimens such as lizards. On his return to London in 1763, Hunter set up in private practice and started to build up his collection of specimens. When he moved to a big house in Leicester Square in 1783, Hunter started to take in resident students and gave the name Teaching Museum to his collection. By the time of his death in 1793, Hunter had collected specimens from all over the world, including the first kangaroo to be seen outside Australia. He had 14,000 different exhibits, with 500 species of plants and animals represented. And many of these specimens can still be seen in the museum today, because in 1799 the collection was purchased by the government, who presented it to the Royal College of Surgeons. And they've been looking after it ever since, which is why the Hunterian Museum is located in their building in London to this day. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 3. You are going to listen to a conversation between a tutor and two students. In the first part of the discussion, they talk about a fellow student. First, look at questions 21 to 23. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 23. Ah, Francis and Steve, <laughs> hi. Now, before we start the tutorial, am I right in thinking that you haven't heard about Lorraine? No. What about her? Um, she's already left. What? Well, she hasn't told anyone. <sighs> you sound surprised. Uh, weren't you half expecting it? Yes, but she could at least have told us, though. 
We've been on the course together for the past three years, and it would have been nice to know. She always was the sort to keep herself to herself. Yes, I know what you mean. Did she give any reason? Well, she got that job. What? Yes, and she's been given permission to leave, as there's only a week to go before the end of the course. But she'll be back for the exam week. Oh well, we'll just have to catch her on the mobile after the class. She's gone back to Wales first. Oh dear. We'll get hold of her on the mobile. She did say that it might not be possible to contact her for a couple of weeks. Oh, okay. If that is what she wants. Before the conversation continues, look at questions twenty-four to thirty. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-four to thirty. The tutor and the two students are talking about assessment marks. For questions twenty-four to thirty, there are four alternatives: A, B, C, and D. Decide which alternative is the most suitable answer, and circle the correct letter. Right to work. We're here to look at your assessment marks for your coursework. I take it you haven't seen them yet. No, <laughs> not yet. Well, you'll both be pleased. In fact, very pleased. Yes. Francis, you have come out with the top mark in the year. Oh. You have, in fact, got a starred first. Wow. Aren't you pleased, Francis? Yes, I'm just speechless. <laughs> And、um, what about me? Well, Steve, you got a first as well. <laughs> oh, I don't believe it! <laughs> you might have done even better, but there were a few faults with the five thousand word project you did on traffic management. And what about the book review we had to do? Yours was, I can safely say, the best we have ever had. <laughs> You're kidding! I'm not. In fact, you have won the departmental prize for the piece. It's a pity, really, that your project wasn't of the same calibre. It's still not bad at all, though, is it? It certainly isn't.、Uh, what do you think were the faults with your project?、Uh, I just wasn't very happy with the conclusion, and I got myself in a bit of a twist with the argument about road pricing. By and large, your overall conclusions were okay, and I would say that your thoughts on road pricing were quite original. The problem was more with the actual end. It was a bit disappointing. You started off well, but then it ended rather suddenly, as if you got fed up with it. <laughs> yes, I did kind of stop fairly abruptly. I couldn't think of much to say, even though I knew it was important. Yes, that section needed a bit more work on it. But as I said, by and large, it was very good. And Francis,、mm -hmm. your project was excellent, so much so that we think you should take it further and perhaps do a PhD or at least an MPhil. What do you think? Um, <laughs> I hadn't really thought about it. I've just been concerned with getting through this final year and getting all the coursework and exams out of the way. I can understand that. But I do think that you ought to consider it seriously. If you perform as well in your exams as in your project work, you are on course for a first. Do you think that I'd get funding for it? Well, any grant will be discretionary, but you have as good a chance as anyone else. I'd even say a much better one.、Mm. If you do get a first, it'll be the only one we've had in this department for three years. And I'd be happy to be your supervisor. Thanks, I'd like that. Do you think I should start applying for it now, or wait until after the exams? I think you must really start thinking about it as soon as you can.、Mm. And Steve, what about you? Have you thought about going on to do research? I have thought about it, but 
I have a job lined up if I get a good degree. And quite honestly, I am fed up with not having enough money to do the things I would like to do. <laughs> I can understand that. Is there anything that either of you would like to talk about? Yeah. I have a couple of things I'd like to ask, if you don't mind. OK. We have roughly、uh, 20 minutes left. So, Steve, would you like to go first? Right. Um. That's the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section four. You will hear a talk on bullying in the workplace given by a university lecturer to a group of students. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to thirty-three. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to thirty-three. Good morning. My name is Dr. Mervin Forrest, and I specialize in management techniques and training. I've been invited here today to talk to you about the cost to the economy of bad management. And what I would like to dwell on first is an area that has recently been exercising everyone, and that is coercion in the workplace. Or to put it more simply, bullying. It has been estimated that bullying at work costs the British economy up to four billion pounds a year in lost working time and in legal fees. And with the problem apparently on the increase, it is time that managers took on board what is happening. I would like to think that. What is perceived as bullying is nothing more than lack of experience, insecurity, or lack of awareness on the part of managers, and not a conscious effort to attack someone. But that is perhaps a case of、um, of my being naive or over hopeful. Before we break up into groups to look at the first task on the handout you've got, I'd like to give you a start with some of the main bullying methods that have been identified so far. Basically, what I'm going to do here is to give you examples of one or two points.、Uh, can you all read the OHP clearly? Yes. Right. Off we go. Now you have some time to look at questions thirty-four to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty four to forty. As you listen to the talk, complete the notes made by one of the students present. The first item on the list is giving people tasks which managers themselves cannot do and which are therefore impossible to achieve. This is, in fact, a very common strategy used by managers to manage their subordinates. It gives certain people a false sense of security as they watch others failing while they try to achieve the goals set. Another simple bullying technique is constantly moving the goalposts, especially when one's employees are in the middle of a task. This is not bad management; it is just plain stupid. All targets and goals set should be easily achieved within a realistic timescale. 
sending memos to someone else criticizing the performance of a task where the individual has no way of replying is another common technique especially when the manager concerned does not reply or makes it impossible for subordinates to contact him or her by not answering the telephone or not replying to emails. This is not the style of a sound manager, but rather the antics of someone with emotional problems. If you behave like that, don't expect your staff to respect you. And now, the technological bully. It is interesting how all tools designed to help can be turned into dangerous weapons. The urgent email bully is fast becoming a problem in the office. Employees turn on their computers to be faced with a string of badly worded emails, making instant and often unrealistic demands, which reveal the hysteria mode of management. Have you ever felt a sense of dread before looking at your email, even your personal messages? All companies should develop a company strategy whereby there is an email code of practice, with offensive messages being forwarded to a designated person for appropriate action. I would now like you to break up into groups and brainstorm other bullying techniques which you think you may have experienced, and perhaps, if you're honest, which you have been party to. I can think of at least nine more bullying strategies. I would also like you to consider ways in which you think that each of the techniques on your list can be countered. Is everyone clear as to what the task is? Yes? Okay. You've got 20 minutes to do this. That's the end of Section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.